I, you know, it's only only a hundred years or so that we've had electricity, and while energy is certainly, uh, you know, it can really help you magnify your force tremendously, it's it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is food and water, because you aren't going to go very long at all if you can't eat, uh, and you you can't eat electricity. Uh, so that was that, that was the, the priorities that we've been setting, and and at, we're both my my husband and I are both engineers, so we're totally you know salivating to get a chance to start trying some of the alternative energy things, you know, some of the the, the materials from Tesla that are coming back out, and some of the other um, you know possibilities for what you can do or or how you could grow your own fuel, uh, those kind of things. But I the food supply has for me always been the the very big the the, the most the key thing. To, to be able to, to get a, to get a handle on and to get some control over. Now you ask how have I noticed? It's uh, in the beginning when I was talking to people. This was 10 years ago, and then we we did that. Uh, the, we were trying to do the farm to school project. I think that was about seven or eight years ago. Um, you know, people weren't, and I always in my community, I'm organizing gardening classes and permaculture workshops, and uh, you know citizen forester and then also you know uh, in Texas a big deal is wildfire preparedness and all these different kind of classes that are organized towards self-reliance and in the beginning I was begging people come you know please come and get a gardening class it's only twenty dollars you know and uh, but now there's been a there, I've noticed a palpable change and I there are I think 2008 was a big wake-up year if you were halfway conscious you were realizing that things were shifting and they were changing uh, I think for a lot of people, the realization that their credit card might not work, uh, um, that was that was a pretty big wake-up call. That didn't happen, but that you know that that possibility was certainly a big wake-up call. Um, I, I think another big group of people were the people that had a 401k, and then it went to a 201k. <laughs> You've heard that joke that they lost half their money, so now they're 201ks. <laughs> uh, they, they're, there's another band of people that is, hey, wait a minute, this system that we've just been blindly having a good time with and following and doing whatever we do and just been, been, been in our, our tracers and just following our path, when they started waking up and going, oh, you know, reality is not quite this simple and I need, need to start preparing. So I'm finding, yes, there's much more response. But then also, um, my husband loves to watch the, the, the network news. Um, I'm not as as big a fan of of the propaganda machine, but he <laughs> loves it, and it's like watching a soap opera or something. And I just we just treat it as entertainment. But of uh, more and more and more, and sometimes it's just story after story of the food supply. Oh, you know they're recalling you know a million eggs over here, or the you know the spinach over here is tainted, and 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 there's all this you know there's been salmonella found over here, and then the beef is. Just, uh, you know, got problems, and the whole, the more and more and more, the food supply is coming up in the news uh, as having, uh, you know, people are becoming very aware that the food supply is, there's a lot of problems with the toxicity in the food supply, and of course, everybody is becoming more aware. Uh, the organic label um, is, is has been completely usurped by the large multinationals now. Uh, organic does not mean anything what it used to mean. And, and I'll tell you, I've been eating organic labeled foods for, for at least the last 15 years. And I'll tell you that the, the stuff that's called organic now is not the same quality of food that we used to get uh, 10 or 15 years ago that was organic. It truly was organic. So they've gotten in there and they've usurped the standards. And, and you know what happens when things get big and they get taken over by big business. In fact, I met a farmer one time who told me um, this was... Um, um, farmer who had been in, who's been in Austin for 30 years farming, and he, he said, um, you know, he w was told by somebody in the industry that uh, what they would do is they'd let the small farmers build the brand of organic, and then when it was built well enough, they would take it over, and that's just exactly what has happened. Uh, you know, and by all means, it does mean, the, the, the basically the thing that organic means now is that it's non-GMO, and that and that's at least one thing that's reassuring. But really, if you want to have good quality food, uh, you've got to grow it yourself. Um, most of us, I mean, I would love to be able to go to farmer's markets and meet the farmers and go to their farms and make sure that they're really doing things well or have a relationship of trust with them. But quite frankly, that's not in my economic range. I, you know, it's they're working. It's real food they're producing. It's real time they put into it to produce it, and they need to be paid real money, and they're asking for real money. And I completely respect that. Um, I can't necessarily afford that, but I can grow my own food. 
and 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 that's even better because then I totally know what went into that food, uh, and I have the skills to do it anytime I want, over and over again, and I'm not dependent on anybody else, and I completely have control over my own food supply. My plan on Liberty Villages was to put veterans, homeless veterans, on in in low cost shelters, on farms and ranches. So they could uh, they would perform a dual function. One, the farmers or ranchers would teach them how to grow food, how to how to raise animals, how to how to milk the goats, and two, they would be there to protect the farmers when uh, when they start go when people start going out to the farms to try to steal food. That's definitely an issue. Now, yeah. having lived in Texas, I can tell you that that's definitely an issue. Now, I used to hear this comment in the beginning. And I didn't quite understand it. I had people tell me, and then and I'll, I'll give you the punchline in just a minute. But I went so I made the DVD on how to grow your own food. So we have a whole DVD set that teaches you everything that I've learned. And I've been very passionately looking for the fastest, the easiest, the funnest ways to grow food. And I've put this all in the DVD. What are the most simplest? And I'm talking about how do you grow food without going to the feed store? You know, because if you have to go to the feed store, that's the same as going to the grocery store. So how do you grow food? you know, self-reliant, completely self-reliant, using almost nothing, regardless if you don't have money or whatever. Uh, so, anyway, I'm, I'm going to the local stores, and, and I've got this new DVD, and I'm, I'm the first place you start is your, your community. You're going to go into different store owners and saying, hey, you know, I've got this DVD, do you want to sell it? And, you know, here's the wholesale rate, and then I'm going for my pitch. And I go into this one store, and the guy goes, I'm, I'm never going to need to grow food. And I saw, you know, hard times might come, bad times, we don't know what happened, fragile society, blah, blah, blah. No, he says, I am never going to need to grow food. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, maybe he's got a big store of food. Where does he live? And I'm like, well, why not, you know? <laughs> and he goes, because with this, I'm going to get all the food I need. And he wasn't threatening me, but he plops his big old black. At that point, I had no idea what it was, some big semi-automatic something on the counter. And again, he wasn't threatening me. He was showing me. Uh, he says, with this, I'm going to get all the food I need. And I had heard that comment before, but I had never quite understood it, um, really, what people meant by that. And then all of a sudden, it dawned on me. He goes, yeah, you know, I'm going to go out in the countryside, and I'm going to, you know, rob people like you, uh, grow food. <laughs> oh, God, you know, maybe they're going to shoot me and eat me. I don't know, but, <laughs> you know. So you defense, uh, you know, as a woman, that wasn't necessarily, you know, I don't have the inclination to go. I'm not. I've never been in the military. It's not my thing to go, uh, you know, be involved in that is, is the thing. But um, you better believe, since then, I'm pretty good with a handgun and a shotgun and a rifle, and I'm I'm learning to use an assault rifle. And you know, I play my the airsoft games that my son plays. I totally encourage that <laughs> you know let that little warrior grow up you know <laughs> <laughs> now let me let me let me ask you let me ask you about something else here what about what about uh, pesticides how do you how do you how do you treat uh, how do you treat your your plants i'm sure that uh, you're not dumping pesticides like the uh, corporate farms are no not at all not at all i'll tell you the very most simplest thing about pesticides and here's the principle this doesn't always work, but it really gets like 95% of the issue. And insects are predators to the plant kingdom. And a predator, you and I are predators for, for various things, but a predator has a function in nature. And the, the function of the predator is to destroy uh, the weak or the not viable species that, of which they manage or caretake. And the insects are predators for the plant uh, kingdom, and, and there's a lot of specific relationships there, but that's a good general relationship. And, but it, and, and I've seen this over and over again. If the plants are healthy and vibrant and so strong, then they just don't have a lot of insect problems. And you say, well, how do you get healthy, vibrant, strong plants? And it comes from the soil. If you're into the garden vegetables that you and I like to eat, you know, carrots and cabbage and broccoli and lettuce and, and snow peas and those kind of things, it requires a good, rich, fertile soil. And when plants are grown in a good, rich, fertile soil, they t don't tend to have a lot of insect problems. They, it really becomes a much easier thing. There, there's a few minor out outbreaks that happen, and some, what I do is I let the chickens in there, and the chickens will go... Uh, they'll go in there and take care of that quickly. But as soon as I see an insect problem break out, I go, ah, you know, those plants are kind of weak and they need something. To me, that's a sign that maybe I need to go give them a shot of compost tea 
or maybe I need to add some more compost or maybe make sure that they've been watered properly or, you know, those plants are telling me that they need something when they're having an insect outbreak. Uh, so that's the, the first thing. Uh, the second thing, and this might be a little bit on the edge for people, but uh, many, almost all the insects out there are edible. And we have a big party once a year, and we've done it for four years, we're going to do it again, and it's called the June Bug Festival, <laughs> and everybody brings, you know, grasshoppers and scorpions and mealybugs and grub worms and, oh God, somebody brought cockroaches. I was not going to eat the cockroaches. <laughs> I don't, and one guy did eat the cockroaches. That was, I draw the line at that. I found that scorpions, and scorpions are going to be in good, good in your area. Scorpions were delicious. Oh my God, I I would totally vie for eating those without you know without having, you know I, the the thing was is I realized insects are a food source. I've traveled around the world and people eat insects everywhere else, and it is a natural part of the natural human diet. Uh, it's just you know we've been so civilized we we don't we don't go there, uh, and so I wanted to because I'm like oh this is such a you know I'm always into free and easy. Insects are a totally free and easy food source, but I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get over my own conditioning, so I thought, well, this is the way to do it. So I found a guy, who's a friend of mine, who's, you know, one of those weird kind of, probably like yourself, you know, one of those kind of fringe guys, and he's been experimenting with eating different kind of insects for, for a couple of years, and I said, Alan, let's do this. Let's have a really big party and, um, and have this really great festive atmosphere with a whole bunch of people and, and a BYOB situation and maybe I'll get in a state of mind I could eat insects. <laughs> a B a B so we did. A B O B party, bring your own bug. <laughs> a bring your own bug, but also a bring your own bottle. So but we had a great we had a great it's and a you know it's party and it's festive and you know what shocked me? And of course everything I do, we've always got the kids, so I'm always having whenever I throw a party it always is the whole family thing going on with all the kids running around. What shocked me, and Alan had seen this before, he, he runs these gatherings now, the kids just go for the insects without really even thinking about it that much. You know, my son, I paid him a dollar, he'll eat as many as you want. You give him a dollar, he'll do almost anything. But a lot of the kids, and then, uh, you know, neighbors, since we've been doing this for a couple of years now, since then, the other neighbors are saying, no, my daughter, yeah, you know, she's out there eating the vegetables in the garden, but she's also, she'll, she sees a bug, she'll pop it in her mouth, too. It's 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 an, a natural human thing that we of course now that we're all grown up and civilized we've gotten away from, but there's a whole nother possibility for your insect problem in your garden um, for how to handle that. But most insect problems really are it's an indication of weak plants, and quite frankly, very few of us have good soil. Our ancestors were very intelligent, and years and years ago, when when they they knew about the land and the value of the land. Uh, I said at the beginning, I used to be a real estate investor and um, very passionate about making money. And I have since learned the truth, the unbelievable, utter truth of the statement that all true wealth comes from the soil. And now, that's true. Let, let, me bring, let me bring up another thing. I have a biochemist friend that, that did uh, my American Heritage and Health line of vitamins. She also had uh, colloidal silver or nano silver which is a little bit better than colloidal silver, and uh, she did an article for me, and, and what she included in our, in our liquid trace minerals was fulvic acid. Now, they had to get the fulvic acid from prehistoric plant life because the food, the, the, our soils have been so depleted on our farms with these pesticides and their, these methods of these corporate methods of farming that we didn't have our soil wouldn't get wouldn't produce fulvic acid which heals cellular damage and 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 there is one plant that can pull it out that would be hemp oh wow what what hemp goes so deep in the ground that it can pull out fulvic acid that's why hemp will cure oh. cancer hemp cures oh. cancer or, or cannabis cures cancer Amazing, amazing. Yeah, you know, it does, it really, and the, the thing about you growing, so soil is, and most of us are going to need to learn to grow soil, but you even need to grow soil anyway, regardless, even if you have good soil, because if you don't continue to work with it, it, it depletes itself just as the farming has done. The really good news is 
so I've been very interested in, in how you make and it's basically composting and composting is really easy it really is you just get your materials together you water it down you leave it there you come back in a couple of months and, and nature has done its thing and you've got your compost it's probably the easiest thing to do um, but the soil is it, it is the key to the health and but the thing is is those plants growing in that soil when the plants are really healthy and you've got this great soil going on uh, and it does not take a lot of land it's amazing how much you can do on just a little plot of land um, but those plants when they're healthy and strong and have those minerals in it well they take that up and they incorporate them in, and when you eat it then you take that up and you've got you're healthy and strong and I can tell you personally this is a so I'm, I'm from South Florida as I was saying before and I, I seriously I used to think that at about 70 degrees 75 degrees that was cold and I'd be grabbing a jacket I'd be grabbing a sweater and I always thought it was because I was from South Florida I was so well I'm cold sensitive I'm just you know I'm a native Floridian you can't take me north and I had all these stories about it but over the years from eating really good food, eating nutritious food, and, and you and I can grow much more nutritious food than even the organic farmers can because we can make our own compost and we can, we can work directly with the soil in ways that they can't work. But since then, and, and my first my garden with our first soil, uh, you know, almost everything died. Uh, the, the broccoli, I was, I was so excited. I had this broccoli and I thought, and the first freeze came along and the broccoli died and I thought, oh god that broccoli died you know but it's supposed to be a cold winter plant and here it's dead you know how could that be and it, you know it's because the soil was really poor but and we, so we've been working on the soil and what i've noticed now that i've been eating um food that is healthier and stronger and in really rich soils is i too and and can withstand temperature ranges that i never could before i mean I'm, i don't think it's cold now until i'm in a, in a you know 50 degree weather or 40 degree weather then I start going oh it's a little bit cold my own temperature range has extended tremendously and it's got to do with uh, the deep nutrition and uh, I found the same with my broccoli plants when I got Earth. really really good soil grew them in good soil well they just thrived in the cold all right hold on it. hold on just a minute I got to do a couple of things here but I want to keep you on because I've got some more questions for you I've just got to okay. I got I got to set this one free and uh, and do this. Uh, Call recording has been completed. All right. The uh, one one of my uh, one of my regulars here is uh, she has a garden and she's asking about. About uh, let's see. She said her zucchini had a fungus on it called mosaic, and wanted to know uh, if you have any suggestions or what what to do about that. Ah, uh, you know I don't. I haven't run into that problem yet. And I'm trying. Let me. I I I'm I'm coming up with a, a loss. So what what where is she? I mean, she must be not be living in Arizona. No, no. She's she's fungus. up in she's up in Canada. Yeah, they have a lot more moisture up there where you could grow a, where you could have a fungus. We would love to have a fungus in Texas and, and, and Arizona. <laughs> now, now, let me let me ask you let me ask you this: What about the chemtrails? Now, the the snow on top of Mount Shasta, Mount Rainier, has been poisoned by aluminum. What about and and they're spraying that aluminum and barium on on us every day in the city all over the countryside and uh, don't think it's exactly good for you but have you had any uh, experience with that do you know uh, you know should we be should we be doing things in greenhouses to keep them from being poisoned by aluminum but it's going in our water supply too it's, it's everywhere yeah there's not I don't know at any point in time I'm starting to do some research on how you can Use, I know one other piece of research we're working on because radiation is another issue. I mean, we don't know what happened with those plant, plants in Japan, but the best that I can tell is they actually did melt down and they pumped a whole bunch of radiation planet wide. And that, that sort of thing is another possibility, even worse in the future if we have an EMP pulse or something. There's an incredible amount of w research going on and it's been created by folks in the Soviet Union 
So they're working with uh, soil microbiology to remediate the radiation. So growing the, and again it comes to the soil, so growing uh, food in really rich soil that has a lot of uh, vital life with microbes and fungi and, and the bacteria that grow in the soil, it's helping to remediate the radiation. And I'm also beginning to see if we can look at, uh, if, can we use the same techniques to help remediate the aluminum toxicity uh, that's going on, and that's that's becoming a bigger issue. I don't have a good answer to that one either, but that most of the solutions that I see coming from this end up, surprisingly, it ends up coming back to the soil and growing good soil. And again, that the key to that is compost, and and compost is a fairly easy thing that you can do. So there's it's it's good we have we're leading towards solutions. I don't have a specific answer to that, and again, you're right. What can we, you know, they're, they're, it's everywhere, so it's not like you can get, a, you can't even get away from it by growing in a greenhouse. Um, Are you aware that it, hemp it, that hemp restores the soil if you use it as a rotational crop? It actually restores the soil, which is another reason they have it illegal. I, I wouldn't be surprised by that. You know, crop rotation is a is a time honored thing that we and that's a part of the part whole part of the natural cycle of, of working in your garden is to, to, to be rotating things through the soil, which of course they don't really do in conventional agriculture. Um, and that's why we have such severe depletion of those soils. That's a, just a whole other example of why it's so much better for for you growing your own food, why you can do so much better of a job. I, I did, um, there's a woman named Dr. Elaine Ingram, and the soil microbiology, that is the cutting edge of what's going on in, in I believe that's the cutting edge for what where humanity is going. Um, Dr. Elaine Ingram is a woman who's been, we call her the, uh, the soil diva, but she's been studying soil microbiology, and she's the one who has been heavily promoting uh, using compost tea, which is basically a way of taking the, the, the life uh, and the, the bacteria out of the soil and, and putting it into a tea so that you can move them to another soil and help revitalize them. But she's been doing almost miraculous things with soil microbiology, I, remediating soil that's been totally t laid toxin with petroleum products. They, they can renew and rejuvenate, uh, taking soil that's been uh, made toxic through um, uh, sewage sludge and, and using soil microbiology to, to remediate that and completely uh, reverse it. Um, as I mentioned, the people in Russia were working to use soil microbiology to remediate uh, heavy doses of radiation. Uh, it's, you know, the, the soil is, is, uh, is this amazing, live, uh, beautiful entity that we often we just call it dirt. But there's a, there's an incredible resource there, and we're just on the t on the verge of, of beginning to explore this. I believe this is going to be the new, um, you know, uh, you know, people talk about n nano robots and things like that. I think you know that that don't don't go there. That's not what's important. The soil and the, what the the whole biological world involved in the soil can do is is a whole wealth. And uh, I, I, I can't say that I know, but I feel that that's where, the, where we're going to need to go in order to remediate against all these crazy toxins that are coming in us. If we, if we can restore the soil, then the, the plants, our, our plants, can produce the fulvic acid that we need for cellular regeneration. Yeah, and you know, oh, I'm sorry, go back to Dr. Elaine Ingham. So we did this class, uh, and we had, we, we had a compost tea on, and everybody brought their compost. And we brewed tea out of it, and and there was a whole bunch of us that brought it in. And she came in with her microscope and analyzed the different things, and said, you know, she can look under a microscope and say, hey, you don't hardly have anything going on in your soil. Or she can look at another one and go, oh my God, you get millions of microbes, and this is a really good soil. So we all brought in our different samples, and one of the big thing that I learned from this is that a small producer, somebody in their own backyard, and it, made the best compost than almost any other compost out there. And it makes sense because it's all about diversity. So me making my compost in my backyard, I'm throwing my last night's dinner scraps in there, I'm throwing some weeds in there that I found, I'm throwing some grass clippings in there, I'm throwing some of the rabbit manure in there. I've got a whole bunch of different things going on in there, and there's an incredible amount of diversity, which means I can have an incredible amount of different bacteria and different fungi and different protozoa, all these different little things. And I can make, and you can make, a much better quality compost than, you know, the big compost operations because they're mostly only using just a few ingredients and they're doing it with big tractors. 
So you and I can have a much richer, um, and we can do much more and create much more healthier food and much more nutritionally dense food than they can, even on a small organic farm. Uh, the smaller you do it, getting it down to the backyard size is the highest quality food you can grow. Well, so uh, yeah, so the soil is the uh, is this amazing resource that we 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 can give. And again, I'm uh, making compost is really one of the. It's really easy, you know. You just you just slap that stuff together and 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 come back later. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> you do need a lot of it, but it's not that hard to do. Well, I appreciate your work. Uh, frankly, you know, I'd love to come back to Texas, you know, to uh, do the Liberty Villages and organize the farms and uh, ranches there. We've still got more farms in Texas. If, you know, if we can keep all the foreigners from buying up the, uh, the land and turn them into, you know, feedlots and corporate farms. Well, that's the whole thing. Uh, that's another clue that you should uh, be aware of. And uh, uh, so, um, you know, everybody's pretty aware that the precious metals are moving up in price uh, and, and stock not the place to be anymore, but there's an even bigger move in a, uh, afoot, and uh, as a, as a, I, I don't do professional investing anymore, but I do try to keep an eye on the markets, and the big boys are buying agricultural land. Yes. So in this downturn of real estate uh, throughout the United States, you know where real estate prices are increasing? Iowa. Farmland. I think our, Iowa farmland went up by like 30% last year. Big boys, they're, they're like, what do we got? We got all these mega millions. What are we going to do with them? They're buying farmland. Um, I heard recently the Mormon Church, another pretty big, powerful organization that's clued in about what's going on. They're buying up farmland. Um, I recently was in Colorado visiting a friend there at her farm, and she goes, oh, look, you know, we've got all these Amish here. And I said, wow, the Amish in Colorado? She said, yeah. They sold their farmland in Pennsylvania because they could sell it for millions of dollars, and now they're starting over here in Colorado. They've moved out. They've sold out because that, that land, the people are buying up the farmland. It's gotten so expensive, and they've worked those farms and gotten the soils up to where they, you know, they've maintained and kept that beautiful fertility that the, the Northeast has naturally with the, the rainfall and the forests they have. It's incredible. But they they said, hey, people were just throwing money money at us, so we we took it, <laughs> we took it, and we left. <laughs> David, so all about farmland. David yeah. in the chat room says that I always got eight feet of topsoil washed down from the Mississippi uh, River years ago. But that they uh, got they got yeah eight feet of topsoil, but. All right, listen, we're, we're out of time. Marjorie, thank you for being on my show. I'd love to have you back because this is an important issue. And and it's really the only answer we've got. I mean, you're not going to, unless we unless we take away the power, unless we you know, stop paying for our homes three times to the bankers. You know, we don't need a 2,000 square foot box to live comfortably. If we're working with people and we're and if we turn those if you got that if you're living in that box and you can turn your backyard into a garden, you're ahead of the game. Uh, and you can take control of your food supply. You can take control of how much, how good you eat, how good it tastes. You can take control of how safe it is. You can take control of how nutritious it is. And everything I've learned, I put in that DVD set, which is at backyardfoodproduction.com. Um, we also have a whole lot of free resources and a, and a newsletter. People are always raving about the newsletter. Uh, you know, so go to the website, backyardfoodproduction.com. And, um, you know, that's the way I make a living is I sell the DVD and I teach and I do research. And, um, you know, your person certainly supports all that. Uh, but thanks for having me on the show. And, I, you know, we've got kindred spirits here. <laughs> all right, dear. Thank you very much. And uh, if, you, if you run into any of those best investors, I got I got about uh, I got four DVDs and four books to sell and a radio show that I do every day for the last 20 years. So I'd I'd appreciate any uh, any help I can get. Thanks again for being with me. Dear. Thanks for having me on, Clayton. I appreciate it. All right, dear. Bye bye now. Bye.